Welcome to the second session of the RISC conference. Uh, let me remind that every speaker will have a 15 minute slot for their presentation, then we'll have a five minute slot for questions and comments and so on. Our first speaker in this session is Tobias Nisner from Universitat Göttingen and we'll talk about uh, bankruptcy prediction. So it's a very hot topic nowadays. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Tobias Niesner from the Chair of Application Systems and eBusiness at the Faculty of Economics of the University of Göttingen located in Germany. In today's talk, I want to present our short paper, Analysis of Consecutive Financial Statements Concerning Bankruptcy Prediction. Yeah. Classified in the research regarding the use of AI in corporate bankruptcy prediction, we are particularly concerned with the analysis of qualitative data from management reports and also from external data sources. And for this reason, it is of great interest to us to first classify to what extent and what level of extraction we can really extract information that advances prediction models and improves their prediction probabilities in line with the high expectations for such text analysis from practitioners. So we really uh, we want to yeah, take a look behind the expectations and yeah, want to see what really is there on information. In this regard, my Today's talk is organized as follows. First, I introduce the topic and give a brief motivation for the study before describing the data set as well as the methodology in the second step. And subsequently, I present our results and discuss them briefly. And I end with a short conclusion about this. Looking at a standardized data mining process according to a framework like CRISPDM, for example, it's nearly really present in the industry, after the phase of business understanding, an example, the definition of a goal and the scope in a project, we have the phases of data understanding and data preparation. And while classical prediction models for corporate bankruptcies are generated or trained based on financial ratios solely, this work logically ties into the demand of optimization of such models coming from practice through the exploration of textual data. We are currently living in a time which, according to credit reform at German credit reporting agency, a decreasing number of corporate bankruptcies can be observed, but the individual average loss amount per case is constantly growing. Simply put, the precision in which bankruptcies can be predicted in advance is increasingly important for stakeholders to assess potential financial risks. While such classical approaches are often trained based on individual balance sheet evaluations, the question arises, especially when looking at those textual data, whether positive or negative developments are reflected by changes in the text or in the text over time. The expectations in this respect are high, but we are not aware of any work that addresses this problem and looks at time series and thus the development of individual parameters in a contrasting way. Thus we define the research question below as how does information sharing within financial statements change with regard to a developing bankruptcy? In particular, this research question also helps to make sense of the potential of this data and to provide an answer of the, to the uh, characterization of text mining features in general in this context. So let us now consider the data collection. Uh, we identified 23 solvent and 23 bankrupt medium-sized companies by comparing current data in insolvency notices and uh, Amadeus database from Bureau van Dijk where some informations are published on this yeah, companies at all. And from the public publication forum of the Bundesanzeiger, it's a federal gazette. The annual financial statements of the last five years were acquired and the following, whereby care was taken to selecting corresponding companies for the two groups based on industry affiliation and also the same time period. So we can avoid 
some yeah time dependencies for yeah, some events that might occur like the COVID-19 pandemic or those things. And the following I briefly present the methodology to measure and compare the information content of the financial statements. Uh, we used the TFIDF, so it stands for term frequency, inverse document frequency, as a technique that search engines, for example, use to measure for yeah, the meaning of a term, word, phrase, or a keyword in a blog, web page, or website, and it can therefore ideally be applied to our individual documents. In this case, financial statements of companies, as it can be used to assess the relevance of tokens within it. TFIDF is therefore a transformation you apply to text to get real valued vectors, so you can yeah, then obtain the cosine similarity of any pair of vectors by taking that dot product and dividing that by the product of their norms. That yields the cosine of the angle between the vectors and those we obtain are trivially bounded by the absolute value of one, which tells us how similar these documents really are. Taking a look at the results, we see on this slide an aggregated comparison of the individual financial statements to their respective previous years, represented by upper triangular matrices. The year Y describes the year in which the bankruptcy of a company occurred, and consequently the years one minus, uh, Y minus one, Y minus two, and so on, uh, the years before. We can see directly that for both groups of solvent and bankrupt companies, there do not seem to be any major differences between the financial statements of the individual companies when the high values are compared. So yeah, one conclusion of this or one result of this is that these are highly similar and there are many boilerplates within it. Nevertheless, we can see that there's a slightly more abrupt change towards bankruptcy compared to the more constant change on the solvent group. I don't know why this is happening. Um, of course, this needs to be validated with a large or larger data set, but even the small sample provides important insights. Well, there are research papers suggesting that the new IFRS, so the International Financial Reporting Standard, leads to significantly new information when comparing pairs of financial statements, that boiler plates could be reduced for US companies. This picture has not yet emerged for German financial statements. In particular, must also be reflected that this information is provided or that those information changes could be provided for a variety of reasons uh, reasons and an analysis for the trigger must be carried out in order to evaluate whether such information is also suitable for classifying the financial performance of a company. Nevertheless, in the context of current research, it can be assumed that many uh, publications that deal with document relating tax mining features are more likely to be considered unsuitable than fine granular observations at a sentence level or a word level is reflecting the small uh, changes you can see. And now I come to my final conclusion. From our point of view, researchers need to reconsider not only the extent to which exploratory granular features can be extracted from uh, texts for statistical training, but also whether static metrics alone are useful or perhaps a comparison of these over time may also be of interest. Overall, through these findings, we hope to sharpen the focus on augmenting the training database of company-based bankruptcy prediction models. And therefore, we are working on a validation of these observations by using a larger data set of financial statements so far. Then, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Tobias, thank you very much for your presentation. I think the text analysis that you presented is, is really original. I would like to ask you, when you do this kind of analysis, what, what are the main difficulties that you encountered with the texting? Um, this, uh, this approach was slightly motivated by other 
researches I do on this field. And especially I'm working with linguistic doctorates together to yeah, take a closer look in those statements because we were aware that there are nearly everywhere boilerplates and there are high expectations. So everyone thinks when there is a high amount of data and of text, there must be information we can use. And we just wanted to yeah, sharpen a realistic view on those things. Is there any other question? Any comment? If there's not all other questions, we can thank our speaker again. <laughs> Move to the next talk. We have a, a change in the schedule. Our next speaker is Ruchi Agarwal from the Management Development Institute. We'll talk about fraud risk awareness. So this is the topic I am studying from last eight, nine years. And uh, I have written few papers on the subject. Uh, fraud risk awareness, uh, I would like to give you a background. I was doing my PhD at Edinburgh. And I was studying risk management across India and UK market. And then I came to know that fraud, in particularly in insurance companies, are growing at a very um, high pace. So I was uh, interested to understand the subject in more detail. And that is how I reached to this topic, fraud risk awareness. Uh, I don't know how, when I started this uh, uh, research, I don't know how companies were uh, actually creating awareness in the organization. So it was a more exploratory study uh, at the beginning. So I found that 10% uh, of claims in insurance industry are fraudulent, that is industry estimate. However, globally, it is generally 5% to 10% in nature. Uh, insurance companies in India are losing almost $6.25 billion because of fraud. And you know India is full of uh, numbers. Every time uh, if you compare a UK company or India company, Indian insurance company, the number of claims an insurance company receives it's more than 10 times or 50 times than a European company. And all companies were bleeding because of high frauds at a particular point in India. So it has become a serious issue in India. So there are some benefits of fraud risk awareness. First is fraud risk awareness works as a speed breaker in the company. Because when these companies, the Indian market was privatized, uh, every com insurance company worked on growth rather than internal controls. Because of that, uh, these uh, fraud risk awareness initially worked as a catalyst to reduce the losses. Second is, uh, it helps decision makers to improve the internal controls because fraudsters are getting a lot of opportunity to commit fraud. And these companies were not aware that where, uh, their uh, internal controls were weak. New types of frauds were emerging. Like every year, like if they are able to uh, identify 100 triggers, next year 50 more triggers are uh, joining the list. So that becomes a challenge for all insurance companies that how to control fraud in such a scenario. So losing internal control can offer high growth to uh, companies, but also a high opportunity for fraud. So uh, this was that, that when companies were working on growth, they didn't focus on controls. They just focus on growth and uh, growth. And by the time they achieved a good market share, uh, they were uh, facing a lot of fraud uh, from the uh, rising number of claims. So despite benefits, companies face four major problems uh, in fraud risk awareness. First is how to identify small value fraud in a large number of transactions daily. So uh, as I told you, there are millions of transactions in, on a year basis, how to identify, identify fraud in those small value uh, transactions. Then uh, another challenge is small medium frauds make companies business loss making. So uh, on the other side, one single fraud 
can uh, cause reputation loss. So where to focus? Whether small value, large number of transactions, or the one big value, uh, high level fraud. Third is cost of investigation is high. Even if it looks like 0.5% of total claims, but in the term of value, it was very huge. So uh, they are not able to justify it, its value to the senior management. That was a challenge. Then unavailability of tools and techniques of creating fraud risk awareness. If, even if they want to, how to? They, they don't know how to do that. So I visited uh, uh, three large insurance companies from 2013 to 2021 to understand how they are creating fraud risk awareness. And I've, I found that they struggled first with what is the definition of fraud, whether it is a problem or fraud or mis-selling. So they were not able to categorize initially. Then uh, they were also confused with complaints and mis-selling. And I interacted with several executives, I interviewed them, I collected field, field notes, and based on that, I found five approaches of controlling fraud, uh, of, uh, fraud risk awareness. So uh, in general, company use monthly magazine, fraud buster, Sherlock hoax, corporate communication, and forums uh, to uh, create fraud risk awareness in the organization. So first uh, approach was monthly magazine. This was a very unique idea I found that this company uh, has uh, said to its fraud risk management department to develop uh, in-depth case studies and uh, to give the tips of fraud prevention within the department. However, uh, nobody read these uh, uh, business magazines, uh, fraud monthly magazine. So they didn't know that whether this initiative was creating any impact or not. Considering this, they adopted a push approach. They said, like, if you, when you are coming to office every day, you have to compulsorily go through a quiz. And if you don't uh, uh, attempt that quiz, you will, not, uh, you will not get the salary on time. So they force every employee to read uh, the information and tips what they have given and appear for the quiz. Later on, they also uh, include a certification which chief risk officer of that company also stated that they, he could not pass in the first attempt. So imagine a company where CRO is not able to attempt a, a particular exam, but the agent or the uh, low, lower level or middle level executives have to pass compulsorily to get the salary. What kind of pressure they have created. And finally, they hired a person to clear the exam to cheat the system. Now everything is going fine. Nobody is reading the magazine as well as these people have hired one person to clear the quiz for them. So this approach didn't work very uh, well in the practice of forcing employees to uh, for the fraud risk awareness. Second is fraud uh, buster. So this company has uh, circulated a newsletter within the company through emails. Uh, the same challenge they faced that uh, they were not sure initially whether employees are reading their information or not. So then they uh, uh, include a software to know that whether if they are reading or not. And they found that um, after a few months, they stopped reading. And they were deleting the mails. So this initiative also didn't work well for them. This is a very creative idea used by one of the insurance company. So this senior executive was taking a workshop in a education institution where one student asked that uh, when you give such a boring material to all employees about the fraud, nobody will read it. Why don't you use some creativity like uh, uh, prepare a cartoon series? And on, based on Sherlock Holmes, this executive prepared a cartoon series, Sherlock Hoax, to educate the employees. And this worked very well. People were very excited to hear this. Uh, to read this cartoon series. Uh, every month they were uh, circulating it and uh, that way they are able to communicate the message. And this company was all also able to control the fraud, fraud and within three years of time they became profitable. Fourth is corporate communication. So what this company has done, they have said no, no internal communication, rather they focus on external communication. The, whenever they identify a particular type of fraud, they give it in media and uh, news media and they uh, they try to educate the stakeholders altogether. 
for example dead man insurance how a dead dead person can be insured in the organization how collusion fraud can be uh, can happen in the organization so that has created a deterrence effect within the society and that was helpful for uh, in the initiative of fraud risk awareness this uh, fifth uh, initiative was creating a forum and what they have done they, uh, they have a cycle uh, they, they have a uh, series of events like first agent in the insurance company missell insurance policies second level the customer becomes unhappy and loses trust third is the dissatisfied satisfied customer complains to regulator they get the uh, the company gets the fines and penalties and there are huge losses for the company so they understood this cycle finally they got the high employee turnover uh, the definition of high employee turnover for this company is 100% almost every employee which you see this year is not there next year customer gets the same policy for uh, a higher premium so customer is also in losses miss selling became a challenge for entire industry so this company decided that rather than taking a fraud risk awareness session at the company level they should take it at industry level so here uh, 30 chief risk officer of large insurance company they joined the hands and they uh, identified the fraud together and they found 80 geographies within india where uh, there are there were maximum frauds and they also developed a map based on it so finally one brainstorming session happened and they they used to invite guest speakers within the brainstorming sessions and uh, that way they are able to create the fraud risk awareness so finally uh, my recommendation is that a uh, company should not uh, rather use push approach to control uh, to create fraud uh, risk awareness uh, instead they should uh, use some creativity to under, to engage employees in fraud risk awareness instead of pushing them that's all thank you we have some time for questions and comments Thanks a lot for your presentation. I like a lot. Uh, uh, one question: I think that is uh, really relevant that uh, people inside the insurance company know that fraud exists, and I think that the main idea of your presentation is in this line. But uh, according to your research, uh, which is the use of quantitative tools uh, uh, in the co in the India insurance company? Do you know if they are using some? quantitative uh, quantitative tools with uh, variables and so on so till now um, i didn't know whether they are using any quantitative tool but i am aware because i am carrying out a longitudinal research with one insurance company and they are able to develop this fraud uh, fraudometer a fraud risk rating engine uh, which base which is based on predictive diagnosis of fraud so they they can uh, identify early on that which type of uh, claims can be fraudulent so they worked on uh, multiple trigger system instead of single trigger system uh, they use multiple trigger system and they put the fraud in different basket uh, red yellow and green and uh, the green basket uh, frauds can be paid immediately because they found the less triggers there but the red the frauds in the red basket they have to be investigated in detail so yeah. strange fact what quantity of fraud could accept the companies i put this question because for instance in barcelona people go to the metro without paying but trying to to reduce this the, this fraud <coughs> is so expensive that someone explained me that about 5% uh, of fraud is okay yes and re try to reduce the fraud to zero is not too 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 expensive thank you so i tell you my experience what happened when i started this research i have gone to everybody insurance company regulator policy holder uh, these uh, fraud investigators all so first i uh, understood the market for a year that what they have done so i understood first that globally it is very challenging to 
be honest in disclosure of fraud. Like if I am the CEO of an insurance company, it, it is very tough for me to be honest with the regulator, for, with the stakeholder and with the auditor. Because if I am too honest, they will question me. So th this is honest picture. So what they have done, uh, what I have understood till now, uh, uh, studying other companies as well globally. So I have studied few insurance companies in UK and Europe and USA as well. So uh, they have decided one percentage. Five to ten percent of the claims can be fraudulent, and they they are regulatory is also okay, auditor is also okay. But it happened till last ten years. Now fraud is growing at a very high pace. What to do now? They can't be honest, but they have to do something. So what to do? So in that case, now they are studying their uh, internal data. That how the, where are the loopholes? Where, where are the opportunity if fraud, fraudster is grabbing? Another type of tension is there. It's not solo fraud, which I am discussing now. The big, biggest challenge is collusion fraud, where the amount is very high, significant amount, especially in healthcare and automobile insurance. Thank you very much. We will continue by saying our speaker again. Our next speaker in the session is Luis Céspedes from the Universidad de Barcelona. I am Luis Céspedes, and today I'm going to present you the project I authored together with Dr. Mercedes Ayuso about passenger injury severity according to age and crash location. So we see that there is an institutional demand to understand new mobility patterns emerging from older societies. Uh, the World Health Organization has stressed the need to adapt uh, Agenda 2030 um, sustainable development goals to empower all the people, such as that they keep their independence, keep being mobile, and are able to, to fulfill their own needs. So our contribution is to understand, to understand better elder mobility, is to study um, injuries when it comes to old passengers. And to do so, we have used data on Spanish traffic accidents in 2016. We're going to start, I'm going to start, sorry, by reviewing a bit of the literature. We're going to jump to some important statistics about the data set we have used. We are going to then review our results and conclusion and speak about further research. So, Spain is an anomaly in the European context, as it combines one of the highest uh, concentration population, one of the highest concentration in some cities, but 90% of its territory is uninhabited. And this cannot be attributed to climatic conditions, as in Scandinavia, but rather to its history. One of the recent events that uh, have led to this is the rural exodus that undertook Spain in the last half of the 20th century, which has changed uh, the population structure in these areas and has left us with a country that is with a rural areas that are older in average. Also, we must mention that when people and firms locate close to each other, there is an economic benefit named agglomeration economies, which also affects the choice of the regulator and institutions on where to put infrastructure. So the country uh, being uh, dispersed and with low population density has issues with this because uh, institutions has, have problems giving people in rural areas an equal access to services as they do to city dwellers. And with further the population, it reduces its cost effectiveness. And this is of great concern for all people because they have, a, uh, medical, they have medical needs that they have to fulfill. So they are going to drive to faraway municipalities, be it on their own, with somebody else or with public transportation. So when we put um, somewhere drivers are old, there are some known facts in the literature that we must review. First is that they are overrepresented in road traffic crash statistics. Many blame this to, many blame worse outcomes from crashes to an increased body fragility. Also, they say that uh, the loss of visual, visual and cognitive abilities is to blame for, uh, for impaired driving in old age, and, being f and they find themselves more in situations that are prone to crash. And elder drivers are aware of this and limit their exposure. However, this, this 
limitation is also limited because they may not want to give other independence they may not have someone to ask for help or there might lack there might be a lack of a good public transportation network so they have to drive anyway therefore it is of concern that if we equal their exposure to crash to yeah, their exposure to crash risk uh, actual fatality rates and injury rates in the elderly would be much higher regarding the data we have used we have combined uh, four data provided, four data sets provided by the Spanish Traffic Authority and one by Eurostat. Regarding the, uh, the Spanish Traffic Authority data, uh, we had four data sets, each which treated a different aspect of the accident. And then we have the Eurostat data set, which attributed uh, a category to each municipality according to its population density. It was a huge amount of data. So working with that, uh, proved to be a bit of a bit difficult at the beginning, not so much as for programming, but to get good insights. So what we decided, it was good to create a relational model where we link each data set according to an identifier variable. So by doing that, we could use filters and other tools in software such as Power BI to direct our research and to see what interesting things this data has. Also, it, we must mention that depending on the level of the analysis, we had to be more restrictive as the definition of what is quality data change. But in all cases, we were above a minimum threshold to have our data considered representative at a 99% confidence interval and 2% error. Also, uh, regarding the, Euro the Eurostat data set for the degree of urbanization, uh, we used their classification, which according to the contiguity and population clusters, they classify municipalities into three categories, be it cities, towns and suburbs, or rural areas. As we had the postal code of each accident location, we just had to match it. And regarding data, just this is data from the Spanish census. Just two key ideas. When we look at people older than 75, there is a big chunk in rural areas, more in comparison to other age groups. And the second one, when we look at rural drivers, there is a big chunk in, uh, we represent, they represent a bigger share, in, um, in peep drivers 75 and above, bigger than in other areas. If we jump to the data, uh, we can see that when we plot the distribution age of drivers from 65 onwards, we see that they are overrepresented in crash statistics. And when we check, when we check passenger age, well, before I mentioned you passenger ages, uh, we must be aware that we had a data set for drivers and a data set for passengers. So to be able to work with pairs, we did an attribution so we can have a data set with all of them. Now, uh, we studied uh, the, aber well, the distribution of ages of passengers according to the number of passengers in the car. So we see that uh, the black line is one, and the more passengers that are in a car, the more to the left and down is the distribution, which I mean that in app when there's more passengers in a car, uh, passengers are, are younger in average. So we were really inter it was really interesting to us this existing correlation. So we decided to evaluate uh, what happened when we only plotted, we plotted the driver age and the passenger age segmenting by having two, one or two drivers. We see that in both cases, there's a positive correlation, which is much more strong for cars with only one passenger. We decided to test this using the Kendall rank correlation because we, find that we found that age data was, sing, uh, was uh, not normal, nor was normal, neither for passengers nor for drivers. And we saw that there was a positive correlation up to four passengers in the car. However, that correlation was way more strong for just one passenger. So this led us to decide what, um, what segmentation we wanted to use. And the issue with these big data sets is that there could be a lot of heterogeneity. It's not the same if you are evaluating a crash between two passenger cars than a car and a, and a bike or a tractor and a motorcycle. So that would have made our, anas our analysis more difficult. Therefore, we decided to make our data more homogeneous by sticking only to uh, passengers to evaluate injuries from passengers that were the only passenger in the car 
in a passenger car, and that passenger car had an accident with another passenger car. Let me go over. Uh, you see in here um, injuries from passengers that were the only passenger in a passenger car that had a crash with a passenger car. Okay. When it comes to the descriptives, we see that our drivers are mostly male, they are mostly responsible for their accidents, and they are overwhelmingly below 65 years old. When it comes to the passengers, they are mostly female, and they are also below 65 years old. Most, uh, over half of the accidents took place in cities, a third in towns and suburbs, and 12% uh, in rural areas. And when it comes to injuries, 25% suffered uh, non-serious injuries, 1,6 serious injuries, and 0.5 uh, were dead. OK, so when it came to, to modeling this, we decided to use a series of binary realistic regressions to evaluate the likelihood of suffering an injury versus the likelihood of not suffering that injury. Uh, we were not surprised to find that uh, when the driver is a woman, the passenger is less likely to suffer any kind of injury. Uh, when, the passenger, when the driver was responsible for the accident, uh, we see that there's less likelihood of suffering non-serious injuries, but more likely of suffering serious injuries. Also, when it comes to the crash location, we see that uh, cities are safer when it comes to not suffering non-serious injuries in comparison to towns and, and towns and suburbs, but when it comes to suffering serious injuries, rural areas and towns and suburbs are more likely to get you injured seriously. And when it comes to driver age, it was not that significant, but for the passenger it was, as passengers above 75 years old were more likely to die. OK, so uh, these results contribute us to certify that there's an equality depending on where the accident takes place. Accidents in towns and rural areas are more prone to having worse outcomes. The analysis of even though the age of the driver is not seen, well, the, dri uh, the age for the passenger matters. As you see that when they are older than say, 75 years old, they are more likely to die. And even though the driver age appears not to matter, as it's not significant, we must be aware that before, we saw that people tend to drive with people their own age. So if all drivers, generally male, go with all passengers, generally female, and there's an accident and someone dies, this implies that the more old people we have, in the, we have driving, the more women passengers we are going to find, and we could expect a uh, a search in the death and all of all women in traffic crashes in the future. Regarding further, further research, uh, we see that we need to understand better the characteristic of crashes according to where they take place to explain better why is it significant and to broaden the scope of this analysis uh, in my PhD research, which I'm just starting, together with Professor Ayuso and Professor Miguel Santolino, we are going to expand on it. This is, a step, this is the first step stone. Now we're going to increase the data we have. If in here we only used 2016, now we are going to use data from 2016 to 2020. We are also going to be less restrictive on the kind of drive, well, on the kind on the on the unit of analysis. If in here we're restricted regarding to type and regarding to type of vehicle and number of occupants, we are going to remove that those restrictions. So we can leverage more our data. And also when it comes to using more data and more complex data, many problems could arise that we didn't find in here, as is the case for unobserved heterogeneity. So by unobserved heterogeneity, I mean you can have a car, and you have two people inside that car, and the outcome can be very, very difficult, very different, sorry. So we must understand why. And if we don't have this data, this could, for instance, bias our logic model. So. Uh, we are exploring new methodologies, well, different methodologies, uh, some, some of them already used in the literature by uh, authors such as Washington Manning, uh, that deal with unobserved heterogeneity, which are random parameter models. So we are evaluating and using a um, uh, mixed logic mo mixed multinomial, mixed logic model, sorry, which allowed us to overcome this by letting parameters vary where instead of having fixed parameters for 
all drivers, we would we would um, have a density function from which we would draw uh, different potential parameters, which we will plug into a into a simple logistic probability, and we would do it many times, and then we would add it up. By doing so, we would overcome this problem of having a of by violating the uh, violating having oh, sorry sorry of violating um, having related variables, related observations in the data set. So uh, that is the presentation, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of quick questions. Thank you, very interesting analysis. I'm a one question, first of all, why did you restrict the sample to a car that only has one driver and one passenger in it? What's the motivation behind this? Uh, had we included more passengers from the same car, we would have uh, bias or estimators if we use a login model, because in the login model I cannot include um, observations that might have an observed heterogeneity. So there might be common factors affecting the accident to these two people. And um, if I included that, it would have biased my estimators. For instance, uh, if I had the car and the two are seated, and one is seated in a bad position and the other is seated properly and there's a crash, the outcome might be different. So I must allow, we must allow parameters to, to vary. So, they, so we are not uh, including the example, uh, sorry, including the effect of in badly seated. Okay, okay. Um, I mean, you mentioned that you want to remove this restriction later on. So, yeah. What one one last uh, c comment or question I have? Since I'm not sure if the data allows to to look into this, but have you considered accidents? Because in in the version that you you have in here, yeah. I was reading it, and your aim is to make streets safer, or the overall goal is to to make streets safer in a sense that older drivers are not prone to, to, to get injured so often. Do you have any chance to remove accidents from your sample that are due to medical um, reasons? For example, a driver having a heart attack uh, while driving and then causing an accident. Is there any way for you to, to distinguish between the type or between the trigger of the accident? Like, is it just because you're not taking care of your driving? Or is it because you have a medical emergency? Is there any way to, to control for that? Uh, well, we do have variables that control for it. The issue is that attrition within these variables is really high. Mm. So uh, had we considered that variable, we maybe we'll have a very reduced data set. However, uh, we, I mean, it is a problem that we do know that people die in accidents, maybe after suffering a heart attack of a seizure, but it's not that significant when we have in in these data sets for because of the sheer amount of data we do have. Okay. It's a risk we can't take as it wouldn't be representative. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other very quick question? No, if not, we just move on. Let's thank our speaker again. Ah. Our next speaker is Joaquim Gavarro from Universitat Politécnica de Catalunya. I'm Joaquim Gavarro, and I'm presenting essentially the, the work of uh, Marc Turban, because I'm the director and Marc cannot be there. Oops, shown. Is there? Okay, uh, the work is about the development of uh, essentially a boat to predict the performance of, of, uh, of uh, NTF collections. Because we are the, from computer science, therefore we are interested in programs, that means we are interested in both, in bots. But to do that, we need to find data frames, okay? First of all, let's remind briefly what the, are the ideas behind this work. A blockchain, essentially, is you have blocks of, inf of information, and these blocks of information are chained through, let's say, uh, cryptographic keys, okay? And this is very useful to make decentralized uh, transactions, and these decentralized transactions can be ever public, okay? 
and this is very important. And in, uh, the, the, the second uh, important thing is what is non-fungible token, NFT, is, is a, an asset or a token link in some way to a blockchain, okay? And the important thing about NFT is that it's unique, indivisible, and tradable. Perhaps for some of you with uh, some experience of that can associate non-fungible token as a kind of digital piece of art, okay? Then you can buy, you can sell, you can do this, but, but it's indivisible. You cannot uh, buy a piece of art and just cut in the middle. In principle, this is not possible, okay? This is different from, for instance, having a, a electronic money. If you have electronic money, you can divide the, okay? Therefore, you are interested on that, okay? And uh, NFT are trade on, on marketplaces like, for instance, OpenSea, okay? And let me remind that a vote, a vote is a program uh, obtaining information and trying to make something useful with, with this information, okay? Now, the problem, the problem with that is, okay, perhaps we, we are interested on design a vote because, a vote because we are interested for instance, in multi-layer uh, uh, network with uh, deep learning, these kind of things. But to design that, we need data frames. If you like to test, test a little bit the boat, at least we need more than one, okay? If possible to have much more than one, better, okay? And uh, to get data, we have to, to obtain the data from some way, okay? And uh, in principle, data uh, should, could be obtained from OpenSea, okay? OpenSea is a market, uh, OpenSea is a market where, where the, 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 the NFT, NFT collections are trade, okay? This is just a snapshot of uh, uh, OpenSea web page, okay? The, the electronic, let's say, coin for, for OpenSea is the Ethereum, if you like, okay? And here, there is just a top uh, of the, uh, just a, a snapshot of the uh, principal or more important collections of uh, NFT on, on this moment. You have uh, CryptoPunks, Boar, APH club, okay? And the idea is, okay, let's try to, to get information from, from these collections, okay? Let's try to build a, a data frame from collection. In some way, we choose the collection or, or Mark choose the collection and uh, the, the, the world consider this number, this set of collections, okay? Luca, perhaps the one reason to, to choose this collection was there is enough transaction on, on each one, okay? Perhaps it's not the best uh, ways to choose, but there is a way to choose, okay? Having data, having data to work with, okay? Later on, I will talk just a little bit more on the second one and on the Be Friends collection also, okay? Now, after that, look, for instance, if, if we take, for instance, Borai collection, and the, 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 this is an example of, of an, an, an NFT, okay? If we choose this collection, not just the, this picture, eh, the collection around uh, similar to this one, Perhaps was not a very good idea to choose uh, collections that are uh, derived from this one because this will give too uniformity to the data. Therefore, therefore, on this work, the derived collection are not taken. Okay, okay, and also there was a, a, a final studied project. Therefore. The quantity of time was limited. The quantity of time is o always limited. And in this case, we get from data from this December 
21 to April 22. It's not a lot of time, but there are five months. Okay? Now, uh, okay, that's good. Uh, the idea is take data frame from, from that. Okay, this is the idea. How to do that? Okay? Now, in this case, uh, the way, oops, in this, in this case, the way to do that was uh, extract directly from block blockchain transactions. And Mark could do that because he registered it on the, the OpenSea marketplace. And this allow, allow him to get information directly from OpenSea. Okay? I look at the, at the files he gets and looks awful. Okay? But he, he gets the information. Okay? Now, when you get the information, the, the raw information, you need to transform this really raw information on something useful to you. Oh, in the, and to do that, for instance, uh, that's, that's true. Eh? Thousands of transactions were processing, were processed in order to have some, some, some interesting things like average selling price or number of units sold. Okay? And this, in this kind of things, you can, you can try to work. But there are some, some problems, okay? There are so, some, some rare cases where you get uh, information that you don't understand. What does it mean, okay? In this case, this happened not so frequently. And, and for us, eh? uh, as this happened not so frequently, we just delete. We don't know it's a very good idea, but we delete. Okay? Now, there is another case. And this is the other case. Two particular cases. Look at the idea is to get the, no, the, the average, the, the, uh, average uh, selling price and the number of transactions for each day. Okay? What happens if in one day you have zero transactions? Okay? You know that sometimes when you, when you uh, work with computer programs, we have to be very careful with zero, otherwise you, you, you can get into real troubles. Okay? For that, uh, for that we, uh, Mar decided to, to just take the, the, average, the average selling price of the previous date. And the same happened with something very strange happened with the, 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 the price. Okay. As uh, we say before, we are not sure that this not introduce a kind of bias. But this gives us uh, data sets or data frames. Okay? Okay. Here you have an example of data frame. Okay? Uh, for each day, you have the, the, the sales, okay? the, the average price in dollars, and the average price in the, the Ethereum money. Look, uh, on, on dollars get up, and on Ethereum get down, because there was a problem with bitcoins and these kind of things. Up, and here, finally, uh, Mark collect the data frames for the 33 uh, collections. Okay? Now, go to the program. Okay? The predicting bot, we use the, the usual, the usual uh, uh, way to work. We split in this way. Okay? Uh, like that. Okay? And we use uh, four months for execution. Uh, we have uh, uh, five months. We use four months to training uh, for execution and, and the last one to predict. Okay? To, to, to predict, we use a, a multi-layer neural network that such that the, 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 the layers are something called long short-term memory and specialists in, in artificial intelligence say that this, this kind of network is very good to deal with uh, data along the time. Okay? 
then, OK. Here you have what happened. We took this, this uh, collection, OK, four months of data to model and training, and the one for, for see what happened. Here you have the, the, the data to train. Here you have the last, the, 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 the last month of data, and here you have the prediction. Therefore, as you can see, the prediction is not so good, but there is a prediction. Okay? Looking, looking at that, you see, okay, perhaps try to predict the exact value was too, too ambitious. Let's try to predict the trend. If, if things go out, go down, or stay. Okay? And this was the next idea, and we get this kind of results, okay, of the 30, 36 collections. On this, in green, you see the, 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 the things that succeed, at least predicting the, how much, okay. Now, wars. What happened? about stability when we have, we pass from f five months to four months, okay? We just forget information about that. You can change, you can see that prediction change. Therefore, we, at least we are on a highly unstable, perhaps uh, things were too short in time, okay? Here, here, uh, Mark is a computer scientist, therefore he likes this kind of, of a small, a small settings to put, where you can put things and you get displays and this kind of thing. It's, it's, it's really easy to use and if you are interested you can contact him, I'm sure that he will help him to, to find this. It's, it's really minimalistic, eh? it's, not, it's not... And the last one, uh, let's, let's conclude. It seems that uh, we just take OpenSea, therefore just one market, okay? It seems that it was not a bad choice because uh, it remains an important site today. Uh, it has that, and for computer science this is wonderful, just downloading data. And, and doing things. And uh, the, the prediction of the boot are not very good, but let's say we have just six, six months, perhaps the model was not so good for just this kind quantity of data, and uh, later on our appears in the middle. And we guess that try to predict, we don't predict that. Okay, and here you have a uh, basic reference, in particular, the, the work of, of Mar Durban. I get you can get it for free from the Faculty of Informatics, but in any case, if you write Mark, I'm sure that he will send you, or if you write me, I will ask Mark and he will send you, okay? And some basic reference and things, that's all. Is there any very quick question? We can read Professor Gavarro at the coffee break, I guess. Okay, so thank you. Let's thank again <laughs> our speaker. Our next speaker is Rebecca Peláez from the Universidad de Da Coruña. Um, this is a joint work with Ricardo Cao and Juan Minar from Coruña University. This is uh, part of my PhD thesis. And I'm going to talk about an uh, automatic bandwidth selector for a non-parametric default estimator that we have proposed. Um, this is the scheme I'm going to follow. I'm going to start talking about the context where the interest about the probability of default appears. The, I'm going to present the non-parametric probability of default estimator that we have proposed and a smooth version of this estimator. And then now we will talk to you about the bootstrap bandwidth selector that we have proposed. 
Okay. Uh, when a client goes to a bank to apply for a credit, uh, the bank evaluates the capacity of this client to face the payment of the credit. They base themselves on certain variables such as career, age, amount of money in the bank, and they assign to the client a credit scoring, which measures his or her solvency. Um, but once the credit is granted, the bank is still assuming a risk. The risk that the client may, at some point, declare himself unable to face the payment of the, of the credit, the debt. So it is interesting for the financial institutions to know the so-called probability of default. The probability that a borrower will become insolvent after a certain period of time since the granting of the credit. If we are interested in, in estimating the probability of default, it is logical to consider the variable time to default. But this variable is not completely observable. It is censored. Uh, the reason is the following. Uh, during the observation of a set of credits to collect data, we are not going to see the default for all of them. We can see three different situations. In situation A, the default happens. So we know the value of the time to default. But in situation B, for example, the study ends without the credit falling into default. So we don't know the value of the time to default. And in situation C, the credit is either paid off or cancelled before the end of the study. So we don't know neither the time to default. And this is also a sensor data for us. The variables involved in this scenario are the following. The credit scoring, which measures the solvency of the client, X. The observed lifetime set, which be equal to t if the default is observed, or equal to c time to censoring if the data is censored, and the uncensored indicator. When we see the structure of this data, we see the analogy of the problem of estimating the probability of default with the problems that are usually approached from the survival analysis perspective. For this reason, the first thing we did was writing the probability of default in terms of the conditional survival function. The probability of a borrower with a credit scoring equal to x, who has paid his credit up to the instance t, stops paying at some instant before t plus b, can be written as 1 minus the quotient between the survival functions at times t plus b and t. b is the horizon of default, and it is fixed by the bank according to its own financial criteria. Thus, our objective is to look for estimators of the conditional survival function that, through this transformation, provide us with proper estimators of the probability of default. In the first phase of our work, we considered several conditional survival estimators, but the one that provided the best results according to, a, to our own uh, criteria was Berens estimator, the generalization of the Kaplan-Meier estimator to the case where there is a covariate uh, involved, in this case, the credit scoring. This is the expression of this estimator. But this estimator, uh, I mean, when it was the one that provided the smaller estimation error, and it was also the fastest one, it had a problem. And this problem was common to all the estimators that we considered uh, up to this moment. Um, typical conditional survival estimators are a smooth functions on the covariate, but they are a step functions on the time variable. It's jump happening at the sensor observations. This fact along with the quotient between the survivals that we have to do to obtain the probability of default estimator, lead to an excess of variability and roughness of the estimated curve. As you can see here, we have in color red the theoretical probability of default for certain model, and in black we have the estimations obtained with different estimators, including Berens estimator. As you can see, the roughness of the curves uh, is clear. Our proposal to solve this problem is a double smoothing of the conditional survival estimators. We are not going all, only to smooth on the covariate, but also in the time variable. To do this, we estimate the conditional survival function in a point t by means of a weighted mean of the jumps that the conditional survival estimator, the original one, non-smooth, takes at points near t. This closeness is determined by the bandwidth g, the time smoothing parameter. And the jumps are defined here. Using this estimator, this smooth conditional survival estimator, we can obtain the probability of default estimator, which is also smooth on the time variable. 
is a general estimator. We can consider any conditional survival estimator, obtain its a smooth version, and then through this expression, the probability of default estimator. But we are again going to focus on Berens estimator because it's very well behaved. Uh, it has, in particular, desirable asymptotic properties. We have found an almost sure representation from, for this estimator and asymptotic expressions for bias and variance. But the problem is that these expressions are complex I, and they depend on too many population functions and parameters that we cannot estimate uh, in practice. So we need uh, a way to find the bandwidth that the estimator depends on. We have proposed a bandwidth selector for the variance estimator, for the bandwidth H of the variance estimator, and an automatic selector for the bandwidth H and G for the smooth variance estimator of the probability of default. I'm going to talk about the second one. This is the resample technique that we are proposing. Uh, we use a naive bootstrap to resample the covariate, and then we disturb this resample with a kernel K, um, a bandwidth R, to imitate the continuity that the covariate has in real life. We obtain resamples of the life and sensory times for, from the variance estimation of their distribution functions, and then we also disturb these uh, resamples with the kernel K and the bandwidth uh, S to imitate the continuity that, that also life and sensory times has in real life. And we are imitating also the behavior of the smooth variance estimator. And then set and delta and obtain according to their definitions. This is the function we would like to minimize to obtain the optimal bandwidth, the mean integrated square error, but it depends on the theoretical probability of default that it's not, it's unknown. So we use the bootstrap approximation of this, uh, the bootstrap version of this mean integrated square error. The problem is that we don't know the distribution of this bootstrap MISE, so to obtain the bootstrap bandwidth, we minimize a Monte Carlo approximation of the bootstrap mean integrated square error, which is in the third line on the, of the slide. We carried out a simulation study to analyze the behavior of these, um, of these techniques. These are the simulation conditions, and we have considered two models, one with weighable distributions for the times and uniform distribution for the variable x, credit scoring, and a model two with exponential distributions. Uh, I only want, to, want you to know that we have considered different parameters of the time and sensory variables, um, distributions to have different levels of sensory and compare the behavior of the techniques with different levels of sensory. Because we, we can do that because we know in these cases the theoretical probability of default of these models. These are some of the simulation results. Here we have the bandwidths that minimize the mm, real mean integrated square error and the bootstrap bandwidths that the, our technique uh, gives us. And as you can see, and as we expected, the estimation error provided by the bootstrap bandwidth is slightly bigger than the estimation error committed by the MISE bandwidth. But in any case, the behavior of this uh, bootstrap selector is reasonable. This uh, resample technique that we have proposed uh, allows us to obtain also confidence regions for the probability of default curve, based on both variance and the smooth variance estimator. The idea is consider the um, probability of default as a curve over time for a fixed value of x. So this is a function that belongs to certain family of functions with domain it. So the confidence region would be a subset of this family of functions that contains the probability of default with a probability equal to 1 minus alpha. Uh, our proposal is this confidence region, but we don't know the value of the variance or the lambda. So we write the bootstrap version of this uh, confidence region. To approximate the value of lambda and the variance of the estimator, we use the Monte Carlo method. Using the Monte Carlo method, we can approximate the variance of the estimator, and an iterative method uh, give us the value of lambda, also based in the on the bootstrap resamples. Um, because I don't have time enough to show you all the simulation results, but I can tell you that the point gas coverage of, the, of these confidence regions is remarkably high, and the behavior of the confidence regions based on the smooth variance estimator is better in general than the behavior of the uh, confidence regions based on variance estimator, the classical estimator. 
and we are going to see that on the real data analysis. This is an example of the usefulness of these techniques. This is the German credit data set that contains uh, 1,000 credits, uh, the duration in months of these credits. The credit scoring, we have some informative covariates and we have summarized all the information of this, these covariates with the single index method. And we have a censoring ratio of 71%, more or less. So we are observing the default uh, for 300 credits out of these uh, 1,000. This is the probability of default estimated for this value of the credit scoring, 0 0.85, by means of the balance estimator and the smooth balance estimator with bootstrap bandwidth, both of them. As you can see, the roughness and the variability of the estimation by means of balance estimator that uh, um, about I told you before is clear also in, in this picture. And here we have the confidence regions for the probability of default curve for balance estimator, uh, based on balance estimator and based on smooth balance estimator. Both confidence regions were obtained for the same confidence level, the nominal one, and uh, according to the simulation results, mm, we can assume that the real coverage of these confidence regions is similar in both cases. But balance estimator needs to increase a lot the width of the confidence region to give us that uh, coverage of the confidence region, okay? And to conclude, uh, and I didn't show you all the, all the results, but I can tell you that the time variable smoothing that we have proposed for the probability of default estimators uh, supposes a remarkable improvement of the, of the estimators. This uh, improvement remains when using um, bootstrap bandwidths um, the, the behavior of the bootstrap uh, bandwidth selector is reasonable in the cases, in the scenarios that we have studied. And also the confidence regions has a, a well, are, are well behaved. Um, noting that uh, the behavior of the uh, confidence region based on the smooth balance estimator was better according to the uh, last pictures that I have shown. Um, to give you an idea about our, our next steps, uh, in the context we are working on, the censoring is too heavy. One of the reasons is that banks uh, grant credits to solvent people, people they are thinking that they, they are going to pay, of course. So they are artificially reducing the amount of defaults that we are able to have in our data. And this is one of the um, of the sources of this censoring, but there is an, or there could be uh, another one. Uh, there are people who is solvent enough, who has, have uh, such a capacity to pay that they are not going to fall into default. Um, no matter how long you observe them, you are not going to observe the default for them. Uh, we uh, call them cure people of the event falling into default. And the, the um, part of the survival analysis that considered the existence of this cured uh, group of people is a mixed or cure model. So we have also proposed a non-parametric estimator of the probability of default based on mixed or cure models that consider this group of people who are not going to fall into default never. But this estimator also depends on two different bandwidths. So we would like to have a similar technique to those that I have presented here for this new estimator to be able to select the, the bandwidth parameters that it depends on. But this is our next step, that's all for now. So thank you for your attention and if you have any question or any suggestion, of course, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. I'm not sure the time you have a day, so months. Sorry? I mean on the x-axis you have a day, so ma months. Uh, months. In the real data analysis? For 40 months, right? Um, I can show you the... One of the you. last... Yeah, they are months. So this is a, yeah, a prediction for 40 months, right? Uh, no. It's not a prediction, it's only a confidence region ah, okay. uh, for the data we have, but uh, yes, 40 months. I mean, in, term of in terms of prediction, you know what, what horizon you, you are 
uh, run? This is something that we are not uh, work on yet. Oh, on okay, prediction, we didn't work on prediction intervals. Seems to be most, I mean, uh, interesting, right? Yes, of course. It's yeah. maybe it could be another next step. Of our and work. additionally, you know, how you calibrate or adjust uh, by uh, such a factors like we run currently in the crisis, you know, very, I mean, uh, uh, big volatilities in change of the ex uh, 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 interest rates or things like that. You mean in real life? In Can you repeat the question, I mean, uh, currently, you know, uh, in the crisis, we have very mm -hmm. volatile, I, I mean, a uh, big changes in the interest rate. Yeah, of course. Which is uh, very much impacting, you know, the credit risk. We are not considering that. Uh, our work is really more theoretical, and the application is... Mm, more a motivation than a real application. So we are not considering any real crisis that we ha could affect the data, uh, really. Mm, our real analysis, real data analysis are illustrative. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You have an implicit assumption that your sensoring is random, don't you? Mm, uh, I mean, if, if the sensoring is informative, which means that uh, I default, I declare default because I have something in my mind, it's not mm -hmm. random, uh, your mm -hmm. estimator can be biased. And the second point is that perhaps your sensoring can be interval sensoring because I decide how to declare myself as uh, defaulted. So perhaps I may delay it a little bit so actually I have interval sensoring because all you know is when I have paid my last, let's say, dose, you don't have exactly when, when is the default. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. You're uh, suggesting that it could be interval sensoring because you know that the client has defaulted but not when, exactly yeah, when. I don't know. There is an interval and I have defaulted in this interval but I don't know exactly when. Yeah, the the cases that we have studied, uh, we didn't see that problem, but it could be an extension of this. I, I think uh, we didn't we didn't found that problem in in the cases we studied, but thank you for your suggestion. Thank you. I enjoy a lot your presentation. Uh, it just a uh, a quick question is that. Uh, you say that uh, Veran Estimator is, uh, it was the, uh, who has the best performance, mm -hmm. and you compare your estimator with Veran Estimator, and just the curiosity is, uh, have you made your analysis also for other estimators, like Kaplan yeah. Meyer and... and uh, yes, uh, we compare Veran Estimator with um, a proportional hazard model-based estimator, and another, uh, two other non-parametric estimators, um, one proposed for by Akritas, and another one proposed by Van Kelegom. Um, no, Van Kelegom and Akritas proposed one of them, and the other one was proposed by Kai. Uh, there were two non-parametric estimators based on a, a linear regression model, and, and then the, the parametric one. We compare the result, our results with uh, these estimators, and Veran's estimator was the the one with a, a smaller mean integrated square error, which is the criteria that we choose. Is there any other question or comment? Since you run a Monte Carlo simulation, right? So mm -hmm. it means that you can. I mean, uh, check this model based on the some um, different, I mean, uh, volatilities of these factors, right? Mm. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm trying, you know, to approach more how, <laughs> you know, this uh, approach can be yeah. uh, applied from the practical perspective, right? So, because you mm -hmm. verify it based on the history, yeah. right? Use that, but, you know, if we would like, you know, to assume that these factors will have different volatilities than in the past, right? Mm -hmm. So mm. try to check more or less, you know, uh, how this model will 
I mean the work. Through the through Monte Carlo method, you mean? Yeah, as, assuming you know you run uh, based on the history, right? Mm -hmm. And then I can I mean assume some certain I mean uh, volatilities for these factors in the future. Okay. Mm -hmm. So try to as well, you know, apply this model for some certain future perspective, assuming you know some certain outcomes. We know very well, you know, in different, you know, yeah. periods, mm -hmm. how looks like, you know, the volatility of the interest rates, you know, the volatility of different mm -hmm. factors related to, I mean, uh, loans or impacting the loans, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I'm trying, you know, to, um, I mean, I think how this model you can use to, I mean, uh, assuming that mm -hmm. the future is going to bring you a different, you know, uh, uh, conditions yeah. that you check, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, based on the uh, historical values. Do you think you, yeah. you, you, you try to, to, to think, to approach in this way? Uh, we haven't tried, but we could try in the future. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's clear that the that that volatilities you are talking about can affect the our not predictions but, but est the estimations. So. So uh, so I think uh, ju just say me if it, it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So you exercise based on the history, mm -hmm. and if I assume that in the future, yeah, we, uh, I mean, in the credit uh, on the uh, in bank loans portfolio, mm -hmm. we have some certain few. Uh, uh, periods, characteristic periods, mm -hmm. which are characterized by certain, I mean, uh, volatilities yeah. of these factors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it it would be interesting to to add that to the estimators. Nowadays, what I know that they do is to obtain the probability of default for each period. I mean, they. Uh, periodically uh, compute the probability of default for their clients. So in some way they are take considering that uh, information about the real uh, uh, situation, but not inside the estimator, only just computing again uh, mm -hmm. the probability of default uh, for their clients. Yeah. Yeah, just the idea is to, to reconsider, you know, how this can be used as a, a tool to yeah. more or less to anticipate, to forecast, not strictly, uh, I mean, uh, applying the model mm -hmm. to forecast, but, you know, to anticipate, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how uh, this could measure, you know, that uh, the, the probability of default, you know, and these things, you know, we... Uh no. I mean, I... Uh, sorry? No, no, it's go ahead. No, no, I, I didn't understand the last part of uh, No, I, I mean, you know, that uh, 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 I mean, uh, having that, I mean, uh, characterizing these different mm -hmm. periods yeah. in the credit cycle, mm -hmm. okay, in, on the, uh, uh, in the banking sector, we have, we can divide, uh, I mean, uh, cycles on some periods which are character uh, which characterize the portfolio the loan portfolio with mm -hmm. a certain level of a pd the volatility of pd loss mm -hmm. giving default the volatility of loss giving default mm -hmm. recovery ratio with that you know volatility of this recovery ratio mm -hmm. so, so th th this would i mean uh, probably just say me this your approach could potentially be useful you know to anticipate what will happen you know yeah. Uh, if we, I mean, uh, consider the next period will have mm -hmm. such mm -hmm. and such characteristics, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I think the, uh, we could adapt this to, do, to, to predict that. Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Our last speaker for this session is uh, David Anaya from the Grupo Catalana Occidente and the Universitat de Barcelona. Good evening, everyone. 
Uh, I'm, going, I'm David Anaya, and I'm going to introduce you a work, a very applied work, more than a theoretical approach, that we have working together with Luis Bermudez and Joma Beresampera, and it's related with predictive analytics for paid apps in life insurance uh, saving products. So a brief idea, a brief introduction of what is uh, a paid up risk uh, emerge when uh, life insurance companies, as we know, are subject to several risks uh, related to saving products. Uh, in this case, one of these risks uh, emerges when policy holders exercise at some point in time before maturity period of the policy the option of stopping the payment premium uh, of the regular premiums or expected premiums initially agreed for the whole life of the policy. In this case, as I said, this, is ri this risk is commonly known as a paid up risk. So we are going to base basically and want to establish uh, three main objectives to exam examine the paid up probabilities. And these are basically they are, these are uh, the estimated of the probab probabilities of paid up risk for uh, a specific family of products, that is universal life products, uh, one year ahead selecting policies, policies with active premium payments in, in 2018 and how likely they are to fail uh, to pay the premium or the expected premium in 2019. The second ob main objective would be mitigate the effect of rare events and choose predictive models that show the best performance and level of robustness. And finally, the third uh, main objective would be predict the prob probability based on the incidence of own characteristics without considering uh, macroeconomic factors or external data to the database itself. This is just endogenous variables that, uh, in, the, in the database of the company. And parallelly, there's a, a second one that it could be the translated stati statistical results into uh, incidence uh, risk management. So <coughs> in a step-by-step -step pressure or methodology uh, would be based on, first of all, uh, a clean transform uh, raw data and, and format and create additional variables. The second one would be uh, a variable screening and exploratory uh, analysis, uh, looking for uh, co-variations in uh, uh, continuous variables or uh, any other uh, variable at interest. The third, world, the third one would be uh, focus on imbalance at class distribution and rebalancing strategies that will be basically involve uh, a cost sensitive uh, analysis and resampling strategies to consider as weighting, oversampling, undersampling or more artificial approach that uh, merges both uh, characteristics uh, like a smooth and rose approaches. And uh, the fourth one would, would be the models and parameters definitions that will be in this case a classification models, selections and evaluation like uh, logistic regression decision trees and more ensemble uh, models like uh, random forest, uh, ICTUBOST and one more uh, neural networks. And finally, a more view of performance analysis just using uh, characteristics like uh, confusion matrix, uh, rock curves, uh, YODES index, F F1 score and the area under the rock uh, curves. So first of all, we have to define our response variable, um, and in this case, it's focused on a conditioned Bernoulli random variable like the following, uh, following form, uh, and this is why XIT indicates uh, the payment state of the policy uh, A at I at time T, being feasible states uh, zero as active premium payment and one paid up premium payment. Since, again, since our interest is focused on observing the premium payment status uh, of the policy E in, in period T plus one, we select those policies for which we know that in period T, the policy was actively, actively paying the premium. The pay that probability in the case P is unknown, but it is, as, it is uh, assumed that it depends on the specific features of each of the policy, policies at time T. And finally, uh, why, why I T plus one will be the response variable. So before uh, analyzing uh, the models, uh, we have to assume some prestige consideration. And as I said before, uh, we have to uh, focus only on additional variables that are those variables directly related to the policy holders characteristics in the database. The time frame of the study is policies enforced in 2018 that 
uh, that they are active premium payment and that remains in portfolio in 2019. And finally, uh, we work with a specific family of uh, products that is universal life uh, policies that are uh, an insurance product offering the policyholder a wealth account where paid uh, premiums as well as returns on the account value are accumulated during the, additionally, to this characteristic, the policyholder is provided with some protection guarantees, typically for death or disability uh, events. So in this case, we work with a database of approximately of 400,000 uh, 400, uh, observations, where 96% 96, 96 of the observations are uh, negative cases, are zeros, and 4%, just a 4% of the observations are uh, positive cases. And that's why we try to approach a, a resampling uh, method on our database. So to, to test the, the predictions, we split the, the main database into data frames. Uh, the, uh, the first one contains 80% of the observations and 20% uh, of <coughs> remaining observations are for the test set. Uh, the variables of the story, or variables that we're going to introduce to the to the models, are uh, inc, that is the premium increase rate, that is a categorical variable with categories like a constant, uh, arithmetic, and geometric. The AGG prod, that is the grouping of the different saving products types uh, in the portfolio, like uh, EG1, EG2, EG3, EG4. The gender, uh, male and for male. And the frequency, uh, that is the premium frequency, that this is the premium is paid yearly, monthly, or other. And finally, in the continuous variables, we have cap, this is the capital sum in event of death. We have res, that is the, the current value of the fund. Then the, the variable prem, that is the initial premium paid at inception. Uh, loy, that is bet the period between the inception date and the date at calculation. Uh, H, that is the incidence actual age in years at valuation or at the time at valuation. And, the and finally, the final PP, that is the number of years remaining until the last premium to be paid. So, as there are a lot of uh, calculus behind of all of these uh, ideas, we chose, we select just uh, three of the models of the five that initially were uh, presented. So we focus on uh, logistic regression and random forest and IGG boost uh, algorithms. And where it, where it says uh, resampling, we have two different approaches. We have the original one, that is just the raw data. We don't transform, we, we don't transform the data. We just stay with the raw data. So I mean, the metrics are quite good in general, but if we take a look at the specificity, in the original uh, raw data, we have uh, a 42% that if we take a look on the under sampling uh, methodology or resampling uh, approach, we can see that we almost double the, double the, the initial value in the, in the original uh, approach. If we take a look at BACC, this is the balance accuracy, and we are increasing the balance accuracy in 22 per, uh, points percentual. And in, we take a look on the rank by uh, balance accuracy, we can see that applying the undersampling methodology, uh, undersampling uh, methods, <coughs> we are obtaining the the, the best uh, the best uh, accuracy, balanced accuracy, in all three uh, in all three models. So, just this is why we, we decide to uh, apply a resampling method here in our um, data, specifically choosing the undersampling uh, approach as the good as the well-performing uh, one so once we know how to deal with the data now let's uh, predict uh, let's build the models uh, predict uh, our test set and in this case we can see that they are actually doing a good work we, we can see that in the logistic regression we, we are observing all true positive cases uh, and no errors uh, no false negatives on, on these ones but there's a important volume of uh, false positive, uh, those uh, policyholders that the model is actually no, uh, not classifying uh, uh, well, is wrongly classified, uh, as they should be, sorry, they should be uh, 
pay, uh, suspending or failing to pay the premium in the next year, but they are uh, in actually they they will be uh, paying the the premium over the year. So, if we take a look at this false positive, visually th these are the policyholders, no? assuming a threshold of 50%. These are the probabilities asso associated with all the policyholders and specifically those false positive remains in this uh, red circle. So if we take a look, we want to improve these results, these errors, and we want to reduce these errors. If we take a look in this false positive, we can see that uh, <coughs> they, they, are, uh, they have a monthly payment frequency and uh, a constant increase type of the premium over the time. It matches, it meets uh, this uh, intersection of these two variables. And if we have a look on the true positive uh, cases, we can see that also match these conditions. 100% uh, of the observations are monthly, pay monthly payment frequency and constant increase type. This give, give us a, a little idea of that we are facing maybe a collinearity problem with these two variables because the model seems to be uh, classifying the observations or the policy holders Mm, the, the way that if they are monthly and constant, they will be uh, suspending the payment, the, the paying the premium in, in the next year. And if they are not monthly and, and constant type, uh, they will be paying the, the premium in the next year. They will be the true negative cases. So to deal with this situation, with this collinearity situation with these two variables, uh, we try to apply uh, different robust models to see if there is an improvement with the results, but it remains the same. There is no uh, significant uh, differences. Uh, we try to remove these variables, but if we move these, re uh, these variables from the model, the accuracy and the, pre and the precision of the models falls uh, around uh, 50 percent. So just basically don't make any sense to apply a, a model to observe these characteristics or predict just this uh, variable response. So what we decide here is, okay, so let's filter our uh, initial data frame or initial data database with these uh, policy holders that match these characteristics. And then, then le let's do a, a, a two steps approach uh, this. Let's, let's just select these um, policyholders and let's uh, model again without including the, the frequency and the increase type. And we can see now that with this false positive, we are uh, able to mm, correctly classify approximately 73% uh, of the false, false positive as true negative cases. Yeah, we are basically now yeah, be correctly classifying approximately more than 70% of, of false positive as true negatives. So now if we just merge the predictions into one overall result or one uh, uh, confusion matrix, we can see that now uh, results or errors are even better than initially were. And that's basically because the minimization of model errors in the aggregated results to the, due, due, to the, the, due to the application of the new model, <coughs> basi basically uh, or exclusively uh, based on policyholders with, with constant increase in rate and monthly premium frequency, we also increase the ability to predict how likely it, it is for someone to truly actually suspending the premium payments in the event of positive term, uh, term results because we have uh, decrease it, the, the number the, of false positive cases. And yeah, we, have, we have to assume uh, a penalty in form of uh, false negative in this case. Previously we were, uh, sorry, previously the classification was practically 100% of true positive cases, but now there is some noise uh, around the threshold of the 50%. And as long as we increase the increase or decrease the threshold, um, increases or decreases the, the number of false, positive, false positive or false negative. So it's a trade-off that we have to assume. These are the rock curves for the different models that we have uh, selected that well, 
looks uh, quite good. And now that we have the probabilities estimated, now that we have obtained according to the characteristics of, of each policy, we will try to identify patterns or profiles that allows us to identify potential customers or, or potential mm, profiles of clients with a higher propensity to suspend premium payments in the period of one year. So that's, that's uh, a very summary. <laughs> Uh, some ideas, it is a quite um, reduced, but the general ideas uh, will be that if we contrast uh, true positive cases with uh, true negative cases, we can see that clients, we, clients who pay, uh, fail paying premiums and are correctly classified by the models, this is the true positive cases, are mostly policyholder with products in groups one, two, and four uh, with lower premiums and cumulative fund values compared to those who continue to pay the premiums that are through negative cases. Also, uh, most of them are almost at the end of the last premium to be paid, established by contract. So these are the major characteristics of those uh, policyholders and those that are correctly classified by the models. If we take a look at false positive and true positive cases, uh, we can see that uh, the clients that the model wrongly classify as they will pay in the premium, the false positive, are policyholders with higher premiums and higher cumulative fund values than those who actually fail paying fail pay the premium. That's the true positive cases. This conclusion allows us to determine a possible threshold relative to the value of the premium and at what level value it should be considered as a false positive, positive case or a, two, or a true positive case. <coughs> Finally, if we take a look at false negative uh, again, uh, against true negative cases, we can see that uh, clients with uh, group three products who we thought initially were the least likely to fail paying the premium, because we, we observe here that the most of them are uh, clients with products uh, from one, two, and four. When premiums and <coughs> the cumulative fund values are consider considerable higher than the rest of the clients in group three, <coughs> they have a, a higher propensity to fail the premium payment. Plus, the higher the age and loyalty, the higher the propensity to, to fail the, the premium payment. So basically, there are some conclusions here as from the two-step model approximation, no, no patterns now appears to be no patterns now appears to be uh, observed in the models that does not justify the robustness uh, of the models. Uh, a second, uh, dealing uh, rate events with resampling methods uh, some substantially uh, improve the final results in terms of uh, accuracy. Uh, depending on the criteria we want to establish, we can opt for the simplicity and easy interpretation uh, of the logistic regression model, or we can select or we can choose the model that, show the, that, that shows the, the best results, that in this case would be the random forest uh, model. The results uh, obtained allows us to, <coughs> to state that the significant probabilities can be uh, obtained to determine whether or not the policyholder will, will be continue paying the, the expected premium uh, one more year. Uh, also, the, the ability of predictive models as a, as a tool to identify customer profiles, or client profiles, most likely uh, to pay it up on the expected premium payment. There, this is just um, more a uh, business issue. Business issue, yeah. Some divergences in product groupings, as <coughs> we have been observing some divergences in product grouping because. Each group uh, mixes products where the risk exposure relies on the insurer and those where the exposure, exposure relies on the policy holder. So we highly uh, recommend to separate into new uh, grouping only those products where the risk is taken by the policy holders. For example, uh, Uniclink uh, products. And there, are, there is also a one product in group three which because of the characteristics that we observe for each uh, policy holder, uh, will be highly uh, similar to those products group <coughs> in group one. So it is likely, it, it is likely that uh, certain uh, errors <coughs> in the classification of the models can be explained by, by this situation. So yeah, this is some references and finally, <coughs> uh, thank you. So thank you very much.
Are there any questions or comments for our last speaker? Yeah. Thank you very much for this interesting study. Uh, my question was related to the fact that in, in this uh, kind of contracts of products in general, uh, one of the main reasons of lapse or paid up are the situation of the financial market, more external conditions, yeah. which are the situation of interest rates, mm -hmm. the possibility for the client to switch to a new product with a competitor like this. Uh, Okay, I understand that in your analysis, of course, one of the purposes is to uh, focus on the characteristics of the individuals, but the fact that in your statistical study, you don't take into account at all financial externalities, mm -hmm. I am a little bit, uh, for me, it's a little strange because, for instance, I think you do that for the period 2018-19, mm -hmm. okay? Yes where the financial market had a certain, let's say, situation, but I think it could be very dangerous to, to use this result to predict the situation nowadays, where mm -hmm. the, the financial market are completely different. Mm -hmm. So my question was, why not to integrate in the model in some way mm -hmm. uh, externalities, which are financial externality, and I am sure that it would explain a big part of the paid up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand uh, your point. And let me say that we have uh, this, this time frame that we use here and that we shown here, that is 2018, 2019. Uh, we work on this time frame, but we also replied, uh, we also translate this uh, work in the 2019, 2020 uh, time frame, and uh, we observe the same patterns that we have observed with the initial time frame. We also go back uh, one year. Uh, before we, sh uh, we observe for, for the time frame 2017, 2018, and we also observe the same pattern of the different clients, different policyholders in the database. So we assume that we are, yeah, maybe it's a, a, a special case, or maybe, maybe it's a special case, but it, 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 you have a huge increase of interest rates. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, uh, we, we decided to apply uh, indigenous only, indigenous variables, because uh, the valuation model or the valuation tool that the, that the company, the real company, uses to uh, valu uh, evaluate uh, in insurance life, uh, <coughs> insurance life portfolio of universal life policies, uh, doesn't, it's quite complicated at that time that you want to add uh, external factors to uh, see how the how the uh, policyholders uh, behave uh, in the future. So it was quite complicated to add uh, external factors to the model, considering that uh, we have to try to apply this study in the valuation tool of the company. So we just decided to work with the variables that we, have, uh, uh, we had on the, on the database. This is the, the main uh, structure and main characteristics of the database. Are there any other questions? Then a question, uh, an, additional, an additional comment to this response as a, as an, uh, as a co author of David. <laughs> um, obviously, external factors has to be taken into account, uh, and uh, you are. Mm, you are right. If if uh, interest rates moves up or down, uh, it has probably more more impact than the policyholder characteristics itself. But you have to set this study in in its context. It's part of a mm, It's part of a project in which we are introducing in our company um, predictive modeling or advanced techniques, uh, techniques of predictive modeling uh, in valuation tools. So we have to go step by step. So, so sorry. Uh, and the first step is let's, let's take our database of policies, let's analyze it. Uh, uh, 
try to do the best, uh, uh, to try to learn the more we, we can about modeling, and then uh, we, we are going to improve those models, uh, obviously with external factors that <laughs> market factors are o o obviously uh, determinants and, and, and paid up risk. So, sorry. Mm. <laughs> I don't to be very cautious with the conclusion. Yeah, yeah, but it's... It could be very dangerous to use a conclusion. I, I am sure that you, you could infer from that complete errors if you don't take into account externalities. Yeah, yeah, okay. we, we are aware about that. Yeah, but we have set uh, some assumptions, and one of those assumptions that you have to assume is that we are only working with endogenous variables. Yeah, if, is, it the is the purpose of the, of the work and for the company? It's just to use the model. If you use the model, you have to be cautious. Yeah, 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 of course. I have another kind of question. Yeah. When you were presenting these results, what struck me was that the fact that the customers who pay monthly, mm -hmm. they are very different from the customers that pay once a year, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, this is something that we have observed in other areas mm -hmm. of insurer, insurance where we see that this behavior differs. Mm -hmm. And I would like to hear your opinion about why do you think this happens? Um, we we sometimes said that people who pay monthly <laughs> are in more financial stress than people who can afford to pay a big amount <laughs> annually. Yep. But on the other side, some colleagues say that the fact that you get some receipt from the insurance company every month <laughs> makes you think about what you have done with your money yep. and then you reconsider your money investments yep. in this case or any other commitment to a contract more often. <laughs> and this is just an opinion. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, not course. very scientific, but uh, since you work there together with Jauma and you yeah. really have this feeling of being close to the, to the real world, what do you think is most important in this case? Do you well, think this is a relevant question, or maybe I'm just asking for fun? Yeah, no, no, of course. We, we got the, this feeling too, and we share this, this, this conclusion with Luis uh, and with Jauma. And it's true. I think that it's the uh, behavioral economics uh, approach where the policyholder, as you said, feels that if you have to pay monthly uh, an amount of uh, money for something that maybe is not as important as you will, you will be thinking in, in the moment of, of time. Maybe yes, it, it maybe have the idea to, to decide to stop paying the premium and, and know to stay um, with the policy. And of course, if you pay annually or yearly uh, an amount of money, you pay it at the moment of uh, initial year and you forget about uh, what, we, what, what you're going to be doing uh, over the the rest of, of the year. So yeah, I just think that it's uh, yeah, behavioral economics. Just if that could be a, a conclusion too. If those that have a monthly payment are m more likely to, to fail to pay the premium because yeah, they, they feel, maybe they feel that it's not necessary right now to, to pay this amount of money for something that maybe it's not as relevant as your day-to-day -day or your family. Uh, uh, things or something like this, yeah. That could be interesting to, to, to see and go further. Yep. Can suggest that you... Okay. Only no. one question. Yeah, kind of Do you have an interest rate as warranty? Uh, do you, uh, I, I think that the, 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 the insured uh, takes uh, this product uh, according to the interest rates that uh, they have as a guarantee because as it's for the life, the, the full life. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have information about that? So one of the problems here that we face at the time that we're uh, in the database was that the pro just there was a, a mix of products that there were uh, Mm, warranted products, uh, unit link products, uh, 
those that we have, uh, the risk is assumed by the company, not by the policyholder. So th there was a, a mix of products that we have to deal and we have to think how to uh, work with them because there were a different approach of who was taking the risk at the time that the policyholder uh, uh, takes the policy hold uh, takes the policy, but um, yeah, again, it's it's likely to <laughs> to uh, explore or to add or further uh, additions to the original database and observe these these things, these uh, different characteristics of uh, granted rates or something like like that because yeah it's right now it's a mix of different products different uh, kind of uh, uh, risk exposures um, and yeah um, maybe it's something that we we, sh we should um, work in the future or work in further re um, steps because there's right now there's uh, it's I don't know how to say that it's uh, difficult to, to separate or to split those uh, products with different uh, um, risk uh, assumption or just a risk exposure. But I, I don't know, I don't just, I, I think it requires more uh, a further uh, work in, the, in this case. Yeah, so. I'm wondering if you consider it any form of um, factors of self-selection in monthly versus annual payment or any kind of uh, periodic payment of premium versus annual because, well, I worked with those products a long time ago and it seems to me that those who make monthly payments um, generally are poorer and uh, for them a major annual payment <coughs> was a problem and that in turn indicates other choices that they would make. So any kind of information about initial self-selection will be interesting. Yeah, here uh, we try to observe the characteristics of those false positive. Uh, I mean, these uh, policyholders that were uh, monthly and constant increased uh, rate. And in fact, they had uh, uh, higher premiums uh, than the rest of the and the, uh, than the rest of the policyholders. So that, yeah, but it's it's the data. I mean, we, we cannot, uh, we can, maybe we can add, yes, a, f uh, a factor, an, another factor to penalize maybe this this situation, but it's, it's just the data. And this data, if then it has to be applied in, in a more business approach. Uh, we cannot just uh, try to uh, re transform the, the variables or return from the, the, the data because we have to we have uh, we have to deal with this information then uh, when it comes to a valuation time for the company so yeah it, it makes sense we observe this pattern but we don't know at that uh, at which point we could consider to add uh, external factors to uh, uh, to penalize this 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 situation. Thank you for, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Thank you very much. Just to keep in time, we should move to the coffee break. So if you have more questions, we can reach the, the speakers on the coffee break. Let's thank all the speakers again. And, <laughs> and let's move to the coffee break. <laughs>